So welcome and thank you for coming out on a wet, cold Sunday. Um, it's a great pleasure to introduce Dr. Portia Moore. I am Carol McCusker, the curator of photography here at the Hahn. And um, between Portia, myself, and Kimberly Williams, we were the three co-curators who created this exhibition, Shadow to Substance. However, uh, it was Dr. Moore um, who steered the content of this exhibition, keeping our feet on the ground during two years of the pandemic. We did all of this during the, the hot years of the pandemic. Um, and she kept our eyes focused on the images of what to include, what not to include, um, as well as uh, our words. It was important that our words be intentional and on the mark. And we had table reads together to make sure of that. Um, those of you who may know Portia as a colleague or as a student, you know her as a teacher. Um, it's her calm yet firm way of guiding ideas and of shaping and reshaping narratives so that there's an amplification of multiple histories that become all inclusive. And the power of the word and the power of images, um, all moving to help us as museums to enter into fully the 21st century and the level of change that needs to occur in museums so that we can diversify our staff and our exhibitions and educational programs are all inclusive and our collaborations are deeper. So Dr. Moore does this through many venues. She's the assistant professor and the head of the Department of Museum Studies in the School of Art and Art History here at UF. She earned her PhD at the University of South Carolina in the School of Library and Information Science and USC's McKissick Museum Management Program. She received the Laura Bush 21st Century Cultural Heritage Informatics Leadership Fellowship from the Institute of Museum and Library Services. She's also a contributor writer and project advisor for Inclusium, which is a wonderful website online, Inclusium, fantastic. Um, it advances new ways for museums to be relevant through dialogue, community building, and collaborative practice. And this exhibition is a manifestation of that. She has served as advisor to numerous museum projects and boards, among them Mass Action. And Mass is also on the website, and it stands for Museums as Site for Social Action. Um, and as a consulting curator and curator at the Columbia Museum of Art, as well as the board member for that same museum, she has served as the first inclusion catalyst, as well as serving as a board member to other museums and cultural spaces. So Dr. Moore has been described as a museum visionary and activist scholar, and her research and her interrogation of museums is so that all of us can meet at the intersection of race, community, technology, and social media in positive ways, and to look at how and where power and authority and race show up in museums. So it's been a incredible transformative experience for me to work with Portia, and I say more and more. Um, we're, we hope we can work together in the future. So give a warm welcome to Dr. Can everyone hear me? All right. Um, if you can't tell, Carol and I have a love fest. Carol's one of my favorite people on earth. So I want to thank everybody for joining us today and for coming out in this weather. Um, for full disclosure, um, I have prepared a lot of slides and I pray that I don't go over our time. But if we do, I'm willing to stay here until we close to answer any questions. Um, I can be wordy and try to monitor. So the first thing I want to say is thank you to the Harm, the Harm Museum team. And by team, I mean literally everyone from all of the amazing um, guards and docents to the team of Carol McCusker. Eric Siegel and Leanne Chesterfield. 
um, especially because of all of the support in helping us to make this exhibition possible. I also want to say happy Black History slash Black Futures Month. Yay! <laughs> And I, I, don't, I don't think that this was planned, was it, Eric? We didn't really plan this to be like a Black History Month talk, so that feels like a bonus. Um, and I want to also begin by paying homage to um, the now late visionary, Bell Hooks, um, who's an amazing scholar, feminist scholar, who, who literally just passed away in December of 2021. So this whole entire presentation today is dedicated to the memory and legacy um, and intellectual just prowess that is Bell Hook. And for the last two plus years, I've actually been um, beginning many of my talks giving um, credit to Bell Hooks because of this ideology that she started to speak about about five or six years ago. Um, she started. She said that she started thinking about the ways in which we learn, and in particular, the ways in which we learn in this age that we're in. So some people call it the digital age. Some people call it the information age. Some people say that we're living in the time of digital and information age. Because I am um, sort of trained as an information scientist and a librarian, I think that we're in the age of information literacy and critical thinking. And so what Bell Hook said was that given the onslaught of information that we um, have to wade through on a daily basis, that it's often difficult to hear one another and to learn. And she argued that the way that we learn is actually in conversation. And so my hope today is that once I kind of go through this presentation, that we will learn from one another by being in conversation. So I want to also begin by talking about the curatorial vision that we have for this exhibition. Um, like Carol said, we had, I don't even know how many, um, table reads, conversations, meetups, lunches, gatherings where we poured our hearts out. We were um, very much in community. One of the things that we knew um, very early on is that we wanted this ex exhibition to be responsive. We wanted to understand all of the um, inquiry and interrogation around critical race theory. We wanted to um, process the killings of Ahmaud Arbery, George Floyd. We wanted to understand what was happening or what happened with Breonna Taylor. We really wanted to make sure that we had language around the political landscape. We were all trying to comfort one another through the pandemic. And we just wanted to kind of make sense of the world that we were living in. And we felt that anything that we did in this gallery space had to be in response to that. We also were very mindful about um, the language and pedagogy of trauma. And we wanted to make sure that our um, vision was both um, trauma-informed and healing-centered. And we thought that the best way to do that was to try to make sure that we had a very embodied experience, that visitors could um, have multiple points of entry through this exhibition. And we wanted to make sure that we first understood that through the landscape of sound, right? And so we thought about how could we create this really amazing um, playlist, a Spotify playlist. So that playlist um, is available, I think, through the website. And it's an amazing playlist. It's, it's very emotional, um, as, as is this exhibition. But we wanted to make sure that our visitors um, had a way to access all of the content and the imagery that we shared here today. We also wanted to have, make sure that the exhibition was participatory. And especially we wanted to think about this process of what we kept referring to as our great unlearning. Right, And especially as a, as a professor um, and as an educator, I'm, I was very interested in um, what I had been sort of following for the last several years, the ways in which we were actually learning new information, but also going through this process of unlearning through 
um, public syllabi, right? Um, the very first public um, syllabus that went viral, if you will, was created um, by a woman by the name of Candace um, Benbow, who actually just released a book by the name of Red Lip Theology. It's, it's an amazing book. Um, but the Lemonade syllabus was in response to Beyonce's 2016 album, Lemonade, um, a very visual album. And people had such a strong reaction to this album that they started to basically crowdsource um, links that helped to kind of explain a lot of the imagery in her, in, uh, her album. We also saw um, syllabi in reference to what happened with the massacre, massacre at Mother Emanuel Church. So there's um, something called the Charleston syllabus um, that was edited by several um, African-American scholars, followed by um, a seat at the table syllabus, which was again a response to uh, Beyonce's um, sister Solange, um, her album, The Seat at the Table. But um, most specifically, the Ferguson syllabus, which again is a, a crowdsourced, uh, usually it's created via Google Doc, um, but it's a crowdsourced document that allows people to explore topics of race and racism um, through the lens of history, personal narrative, et cetera, followed by the Charlottesville syllabus, which was uh, created in response to, um, I don't know what the right word is, but the riots and protests uh, surrounding uh, the removal of the Confederate uh, monument in Charlottesville, Virginia. So I don't know if you all have access to the syllabus. If you have, if you could kind of wave it. Eric, I'm not sure where they are located in the museum, but make sure that you have that you get a copy of it before they're a hot commodity. They're, they're gone. Um, and so again, we you know we started talking about this notion of like the great unlearning, but also listening to the language that people were using around this topic of race, blackness, identity, police brutality, that kind of thing. We kept coming back to a number of questions. The questions that I'm most interested in as an information scientist, information theorist, whatever, is where do images come from? Who creates images? Does it matter who creates those images? How do you connect the image with information and how do you critically evaluate that image with information that is factual, true, and unbiased, right? So again, we're talking about uh, information literacy. So I want you to look at these two images and I just want everybody to shout out, who's this person in the first photograph? Rosa Parks, second photograph. Okay, so everybody automatically knows who those folks are. Anybody wanna kind of give out a really quick summary of what they did? Why do we know them? There's no wrong answer. Okay, so she helped to or integrate the trans public transportation. Okay, good. Anyone else? Martin Luther King, what did he do? Okay. Okay. So I want, so I, I begin with these two figures because they're historic, iconic figures, right? sort of, sort of um, burned into our American psyche in terms of thinking about civil rights, uh, imagery associated and connected to civil rights. And now I want you to tell me, who is this? Trayvon Martin. And so what do you know about Trayvon Martin? Okay, he was murdered. Why was he murdered? Does he have what? A hoodie, okay. But what else do we know about Trayvon Martin? He was a teenager? He likes Skittles. He Skittles? Okay, anybody have any other comments? Okay, who is this person right here, this first image? I think I heard somebody say it. Yes, Elijah McCain. What do you know about Elijah McCain? Okay, he was murdered. Why? Walking at night? Okay, raise your hand if you actually know the story of Elijah McCain. Okay, so I'm going to, I just, 
Take a look around. I think I had maybe two hands, maybe. So you know this image, perhaps, but raise your hand if you know who both of these folks are. Okay, so I want that to settle in your mind about why, you know, where do we get images from? What is the history and information that we know about the image? What's the narrative? The second image, who is this? Who is it? That's not Breonna Taylor. Who is this? Okay, raise your hand if you know who this is. You don't know who this is. Okay, so your homework is, <laughs> look up Makia Bryant. This is Makia Bryant. And Makia Bryant was a, a, a young teenager who was it cycled in and out of foster homes and had been in an abusive foster home situation where girls were being um, really you know, brutal to her, mistreating her, blah, blah, blah. She got into a fight and she had a knife in her hand and she was gunned down by a police officer. So if you don't know the story of Makia Bryant, you need to know who that is. And so I begin our conversation today again, with us thinking about why is it that we think when we see an image, we know a story or do not know a story? What is the information that we, that we have? So the exhibition, what is this exhibition about? So that's the thing, where is Carol? Oh, okay. Uh, that's the thing that we kept coming to as we were formulating what our goal was for the, with the exhibition. And Carol had this beautiful idea um, that I think kind of emerged with the series of photographs of the Underground Railroad pictured at night that's here on this back wall, but then also thinking about this image that she kept coming back to of Sojourner Truth. Um, and then we also kept coming back to the image of Frederick Douglass. And again, nine times out of 10, most Americans will know who these two figures are. These are photographs that are seen so many times that we don't even actually think about the origin or the source. And so the goals for this exhibition, we wanted to actually disrupt the visual canon. We wanted to ask you all what, how it is that you, what is it that you're thinking about when you think about visions and imagery surrounding blackness and black people? And we really wanted to critically interrogate Again, what we really knew about personal and historical narratives behind these icon iconic figures, and we wanted to challenge you all to disrupt your own understanding of black visual culture. I personally wanted to um, ask visitors to increase awareness of black photographers. So not just you know the, the same old names like Gordon Parks, but who's actually working in um, photography as a genre and as a discipline and as an art form today and why does it matter? Um, I wanted to make sure that we highlighted black contributions to photography. I wanted us to explore, um, we all wanted to, I should say we, we all wanted to explore uh, the notion of black portraiture. And again, we wanted to challenge visitors to analyze media images of blackness. So Sojourner Truth was born around, uh, sorry, was born around 1797 and died in 1883. Her birth name was um, Isabella Baumfrey. Um, if you look at all of the archival records, she's known to have a, a pretty strong Dutch um, accent because of her enslavers. Um, when you look at the physical description of um, Sojourner Truth, she's always depicted as someone who was very tall, very large, very dark skinned. Um, seeming to have almost like a kind of physical uh, power so that when she entered a room, you knew that she was in the space, right? And if you look here at the bottom, um, this is a little card, um, I'm forgetting, forgive me, I'm forgetting the actual name. Um, but on the bottom it says, I sell the shadow to support the substance. I sell the shadow to support the substance. And we're gonna talk in a minute about what that means to sell the shadow. And then we wanted to kind of begin, so when I think about um, this first wall when you come in uh, to the exhibition space, we also wanted to contrast that image with the image of Fred Frederick Douglass. Again, another iconic image that we think we know, we see all the time, but what is it that we actually know about Frederick Douglass and his contributions? He, was, um, he fled slavery in 1838 
And he actually sat for his first photograph um, three years after that. And the thing that I think that is so powerful about Frederick Douglass is that in his lifetime, he sat for over 160 portraits, over 160 portraits. And at one point, he was the most photographed person in the entire United States, a black man who basically freed himself from the institution of slavery. So I have three images here um, of Sojourner Truth. When you, when you look at these images, you can just sort of shout it out. What, is there any kind of like emotion? What do you feel, what do you, what do you see when you look at this image? What, what, what kind of uh, response do you have about her person? Power. Strength, power, what else? Okay, which thank you for saying that because I think that is some of the power of uh, portraiture, right? The thing about Sojourner Truth that I want us to, to be mindful of and to look at is that her image is very calculated, very staged. So in almost every portrait that you will see of um, Sojourner Truth, particularly when you look at this first one, there's objects around her that suggest something. So she's got um, yarn, she's knitting, that suggests softness, femininity, personhood, womanhood. Um, it suggests that she has a place, if you will, in society, that she has her own agency. Um, this one, it's a little bit, I, I say it's a smile. I don't know if it's necessarily a smile, but the one in the middle to me looks like a very humble smile, if you will. Now let's, let's compare uh, Sojourner's portraits to Frederick Douglass's portrait. So while Sojourner Truth was very intentional about um, this sort of staging and um, really thinking about what her image would do when it went out into the world, Frederick Douglass had the same exact um, goal, except Frederick Douglass almost never smiled in any of his portraits. And in fact, he wanted no objects around him because he wanted the viewer to look specifically and intently at his face and especially at his eyes, right, his countenance. And what he said was that he wanted white viewers to be able to look at his portrait and to be able to see the haunting darkness of the institution of slavery. He did not, he wanted to counter that with images of the laughing, joking, smiley, happy, enslaved Negro caricature that so many um, enslavers were sort of putting out there, right? So he wanted the, his image to depict dignity, strength, power, but also to some degree, this notion of like um, haunting sadness, if you will. I wanted to make sure that I talked today about the relationship between Frederick Douglass and John Brown. So who is John Brown? Abolitionist. What is he known for? Say it again. Yes, thank you. Leading an, uh, an insurrection at Harper's Ferry. Was he successful? No. Um, the, the thing about... Um, Oh, I'm sorry, the thing about John Brown um, is that you know he, he and his whole party, they were caught, they were executed. Um, John Brown and Frederick Douglass had this really um, intense, complicated friendship and relationship. They spent a lot of time in and out of each, out of each other's homes. Um, at one point, Frederick Douglass was sort of like a precursor, if you will, to Martin Luther King in terms of his nonviolent stance on how um, enslaved folk would become free, right? So his whole emancipation thought was, we're not going to get free until we actually have legislation that makes people free, right? So he was basically like, we can use the vote and we can use politics to um, emancipate. Whereas John Brown was like, we need to just kill everybody and this thing will not actually ever happen until there's actual bloodshed. And he literally had a pedagogy of bloodshed. So you're talking about two almost polar opposite um, 
folks in terms of thinking, but they were both abolitionists, right? Um, Frederick Douglass, um, basically in his writings, he basically said, John Brown was so compelling and so impressive that he started to make me think about whether or not blood was going to have to be the actual method for emancipation. So that's how compelling uh, John Brown was. I want to make sure, though, that we have this visual of these two portraits of these two powerful historic figures. And I say that because Frederick Douglass is known for you know, giving speeches on this sort of abolition um, trail, if you will, where they went and you know, had these planned talks all over. But Frederick Douglass is, should be known, I should say. He should be known for this one interesting fact, and that is he penned four speeches about the power of photography in his lifetime. One of those speeches is actually um, one of the most famous early speeches or, and or writings about the power of photography to help change white people's minds about the humanity of black folks, but also the power of the portrait itself as a tool for emancipation. And um, uh, Celeste Marie Bernier, who was an author of this book called Picturing Frederick Douglass, wrote that photography was the lifeblood of being able to be seen and not caricatured, to be represented and not grotesque, to be seen as fully human and not as an object or chattel to be bought and sold. Douglas once wrote, the humblest servant girl may now possess a picture of herself, such as the wealth of kings could not purchase 50 years ago. He viewed photography as the most democratic of the arts. I also want to say that Sojourner Truth is the first person to ever copyright her own image. So think about that. You are born um, enslaved, and then you become an abolitionist and a suffragist, and then you actually are the first person to copyright an image and then sell this image to fund abolition work, but also to fund the suffrage movement, which I want to get on my little soapbox and say, we, we know Sojourner Truth as an abolitionist, but a lot of her work, some of the most important work, was uh, her work as a suffragist. She's not often um, viewed in that light. So what is meant by the shadow? So again, Frederick Douglass was very mindful of um, the sketches, the, um, the verbal language that was out in the atmosphere around how um, racist whites, particularly racist whites in the South, viewed black folks. And so we had a lot of conversation about, OK, so what is the shadow? And by shadow, I am specifically talking about what is the visual and um, the visual canon that imagery that we are saturated with, in particular in the media, and how do we keep seeing that um, in the media? So these are images, um, Jim Crow images, you know, um, tropes and stereotypes of the happy dancing Negro, the pickaninny, the person who's always smiling, with you know, showing these. Um, glowing whites of the eyes or glowing uh, white teeth, eating watermelon. You've got the mammy figure, um, the ways in which these racist imagery uh, showed up in um, cartoons. Um, but then also, again, these other images that were out, again, because of the uh, invention of photography, where we saw some of the physical horrors of the institution of slavery. And then I, I want to make sure that I'm being as clear as possible to say that the shadow still remains. So the shadow has not gone anywhere. So who, who knows what this image is on the far right? It's black-based, but this one with the person with the sweater, do you know what that incident is? It's a very relevant issue. Yes, it, Gucci. So in 2019, uh, 20, early 2020, 
Gucci got into a lot of trouble because they, I forgot, I think the sweater was like a thousand or two thousand dollars. It was some outrageous price. But this was um, a sweater that Gucci produced that they said they had no idea, no understanding that this sweater uh, spoke to, to the history, the painful history, and the visual canon of blackface. They were like, what do you mean? It's just, you know, it's a funny, interesting sweater that we're selling for like $1,500 or whatever it is. Um, and so I, I, I make that example to say the shadow has not gone anywhere. And so we wanted to make sure that in this exhibition, again, we were being responsive, that we were in, in conversation with all of these, um, the language, again, you know, the whole kerfuffle around critical race theory, you know, people navigating um, death and grief around so many things, pandemic, Ahmaud Arbery, um, George Floyd. And we wanted to um, make sure that this exhibition served as a counter narrative. And by counter narrative, we meant what are the ways that we can be intentional about not ignoring all of the things that have been happening, but being in response to them, but also thinking about presenting images and or presenting um, photographers that balanced out or again, added new dimensions to, to this overall narrative. So we wanted to make sure that we um, presented images that spoke to black joy, resist, uh, sorry, rest as resistance, land liberation, agency, agency, dismantling stereotypes. We wanted to be able to put images on the wall that spoke to black death and that spoke to black grief and have you all question why it is that America seems so hell bent on consuming those things. We are hell bent on consuming black death and black grief. And then we are hell bent on um, commenting on quote unquote black rage, right? So we wanted to be in conversation with that. We also wanted to talk about the, this other history around black people and blackness that doesn't often get talked about. We wanted to talk about migration and movements. We wanted to talk about the diaspora. We wanted to talk about what is black masculinity? Um, we wanted to understand, particularly in the context of the modern time that we live in, what is the Underground Railroad? And we wanted to understand abolition, not just in this historic sense, but also what does abolition mean now? There's lots of abolition movements that are, that are occurring now. And we also wanted to highlight and, illum and illuminate um, Black writers, makers, and creatives. And so again, happy Black History, Black Futures Month. <laughs> um, I wanted to shift a little bit to thinking about black photographic futures and then also the historical legacy of black photographers. And I wanted to do that by showing, let me check my time. Eric, do a little dance or something if I'm like <laughs> going super over my time. Okay. Um, um, so I, I wanted to be able to do that by showing you all my favorite black photographers so that again, I'm, I wanted to introduce those photographers into the room today, and I want you to be able to see how these photographers are in conversation with one another, the, the, the photographers that are, that are on the wall today. So I wanted to begin with um, Jean Montesumi Ash, who is an amazing photographer. Um, she was married to um, Arthur Ash, the famed uh, tennis player, Arthur Ash. And she's also known as an HIV AIDS activist because she started a foundation in his honor. And Jean Montesumi Ash, um, the, she's, she has a lot of work that, a body of work that she's known for, but the body of work that I wanted to call out and illuminate is the work that she did documenting the lives of um, the descendants of the formerly enslaved on Defusky Island. And unfortunately, G. Montesumi Ash's photographs are pretty much the last images that we have of this sort of old life, if you will, um, of these descendants on Defusky Island. 
Um, this is Jake and his boat arriving on Defusky Shore, 1978, and this is Shrimper and Son, 1978. If you have, how many of you have ever been to Defusky Island? So right now, it it literally is this beautiful island. I think you have to pay 35 or 40 dollars to take the ferry to get to. Is it's now basically the playground of the uber rich who have like multi million dollar. Um, mansions and like basically a golf resort. Um, there's almost no living descendants, and it's basically now a private island. So if you think about if you know the um, the author Pat Conroy, and the the movie um, and book um, Conrack, Conrack um, is about the people of Defusky. This is Carrie Mae Weems, who you all may or may not know. She's you know recognized as one of the um, most famous uh, black photographers of our time. Um, I had an amazing opportunity to see her retrospective at the Portland Museum of Art some years ago, and it was just absolutely fantastic. This is one of um, her most known bodies of work. It's basically what made her famous from her series called the Kitchen Table Series. It's 20 photographs in black and white where this is Carrie Mae Weems herself, where she's sitting around and sort of telling these visual stories about her interpretation of her life, um, about black women's um, motherhood, relationship uh, status, um, just, you know, just basically her investigating her life. I had to make sure that you all knew about Tyler. He's known as Tyler the photographer. His real name is Tyler Mitchell, very young, born in 1995. Um, Tyler, the photographer, or Tyler Mitchell, um, is the first black photographer um, to work, or not even work for it, but like shoot a cover at Vogue in over a hundred, I think it's a hundred and twenty something year history of Vogue. He's, um, at the time, he was 23 years old. Um, he shot the very coveted September issue of Vogue um, depicting Beyonce. And um, there was actually two different versions of uh, his cover, and he has something, um, his, his approach and stance to photography is something that he calls the Black Utopian Vision, which is basically his um, way of taking these very beautiful, nuanced pictures, particularly of, of young Black youth, um, but basically almost not quite Afrofuturistic, but basically him saying the photographs that I'm offering is this beautiful sort of playful world in which black people um, don't necessarily have to go up against harm. They can just sort of be um, themselves. And he came up with this philosophy because as a young person, um, he had gotten a, a travel scholarship to take photographs for about six weeks or so in Cuba. And he took all of these beautiful photographs and footage of Cuban skateboarders and published a book. And he said that um, he grew up sort of looking at these beautiful images that were on Tumblr and saw all these young, happy, joyful, white youth. And he just kept thinking to himself, I never see pictures of like happy, young black people. Like, where is that? And he basically set out to create that and to center um, to sort of nuanced beauty, if you will. This is the second um, of his Beyonce Vogue co covers. Um, this first image um, is now part of the permanent collection at the National uh, Portrait Gallery. Um, he had a solo exhibition called I Can Make You Feel Good because again, he's really concerned about images around joy, personhood, um, future possibilities for young um, youth. I love, I think these are beautiful photographs. And again, this is from his um, I Can Make You Feel Good exhibition. The other artist that I wanted to um, bring into the room is Zanelle Mahole, who's a, a queer South African um, photographer. Um, she's always taking these beautiful photographs. Um, and there's, you know, there's debate as to whether or not you think it's blackface or, you know, whatever that is. We can have, that could be another conversation. But she's basically countering um, images both of uh, LGBTQI plus life in Africa, like on, on the continent, but also she's questioning who gets to say what is African. 
That's her biggest question. Who gets to say what is African? Um, they call themselves a visual activist. And pretty much all the work I've almost ever seen of them, with the exception of the work documenting um, queer life in South Africa, is usually a self-portrait of some kind. And this is um, uh, some of the work from their LGBTQI plus series. Gordon Parks. So Gordon Parks, again, is another one of my favorite uh, photographers. I could, we can't have any discussion about anybody in this room or on the wall without mentioning Gordon Parks. If you interview all of these people, they will tell you that their inspiration comes from Gordon Parks. Um, this is a, you know, his very famous image, Children with Doll, 1942. This is Colored Entrance. This is one of my favorite Gordon Parks images, um, night, uh, shot in 1956 in Mobile, Alabama. Um, these are two, this image in particular is an image that I kept coming to over and over and when I was like in my 20s learning about, you know, um, figures from like black national movements, figures, you know, like um, Malcolm X, um, Garvey, um, and this is an image of Ethel Sharif, who is the daughter of Elijah Muhammad, but who was also married to forgot his exact title, but like the chief of security for um, the um, Nation of Islam. And then um, Gordon Parks has an entire series um, that he took from 1966 to 1970 of Muhammad Ali. So almost every image that you see, particularly those in black and white of Muhammad Ali are taken by Gordon Parks. So that shows you the, um, the, the impact and power of his work. I could not, oops, sorry, I could not, um, not talk about um, Mafon Essien, who passed away in 2001. Mafon was born uh, and raised in Nigeria and then um, came to this country with her parents like the first maybe two to five years of her life. Um, she was beginning, her star had um, begun to rise. She was like on all of these lists as like black photographers to watch, black women photographers to watch. And then she tragically was diagnosed with like, I think it, I think it was um, like quadruple negative breast cancer and was about to open like um, this huge exhibition and passed away four days before the exhibition opened. And there were so many, there's so many black women photographers who pay homage to um, my phone that, um, they came together and basically created a book called Women Photographers of the African Diaspora, and they named it after her. Um, she's most known for all of her photographs, sort of, um, you know, depicting her life post mastectomy. Um, I also wanted to bring into the room my favorite group, and I don't, I didn't uh, call out any particular. Um, photographers only because I want everybody, if you have your phone or if you want to take a note or whatever, take a picture. This is my favorite collective. It's called a uh, group called Black Female Landscape and Nature Photographers. You can find them. They have a website, but you can find them on Instagram. These beautiful photographs um, taken by Black women from across the United States. They get together and they have these meetups and they go to these locations and take beautiful photographs. And their goal is to increase awareness of black females in landscape and nature photography. Um, this is some of the participants. Look how beautiful, that reminds me of like an Ansel Adams uh, photograph. Um, and so it's blackfemalelandscapephotogs.com. Um, I also wanted to call into the room Nona Faustine. If you don't know who Nona Faustine is, you have to know who that is. She's another person who's like a rising star, if you will. Um, in photography, won all of these different awards, residencies and fellowships. This is a picture of Nona. This is from, um, this is one of her most known works. It's from a series that she has called White Shoes, where she's intentionally, um, usually naked or almost naked in public spaces. And the white shoes represent not only whiteness and um, like thinking about institution, but also thinking about, well, what, again, what is blackness? Her, her artist statement is that she is situated inside a photographic tradition while questioning the culture that bred that tradition. 
My practice walks the line between the part and the present, and my work starts where intersecting identities meet history. She uses self-portraiture to explore the legacy of trauma that African Americans have inherited while reconstructing the narratives of race and stereotypes through a privileging of memory, folklore, and personal histories. Um, and so you can see the, you know, I'm dating myself, but I had these shoes. You know, like the toddler, what's the right word? But you know, it has the, the hard thing on the, you know, you know what I'm saying, on the bottom. Um, but again, this is from her series, White Shoes. I forgot the name of this series, but this is another sort of iconic uh, photograph um, by Nona Faustine. I cannot end without talking about the contributions and legacies of James Vandersee, um, born in 1886 and died in 1983. If, again, if you were to survey all of the photographers, either on the wall or in the slides, in the previous slides, everyone pays homage to James Vandersee, um, who is credited as the godfather, if you will, of black photography, modern black photography, and who single-handedly um, took thousands of pictures um, documenting and preserving the lives of black folks in Harlem, particularly famous figures from the Harlem Renaissance. He's known as, he's known as sort of um, contributing to, again, black portraiture, but portraiture in general as an art form in photography. This is one of my favorites. This is called Black Couple. Um, what I think is interesting about James Van Der Zee is the trust that he must have had as a photographer because he showed up at birthday parties, everybody's wedding, funerals. This dude was everywhere. Like if you needed somebody to document something, you called James Van Der Zee. He had a studio um, and he was just a, a beloved um, photographer in Harlem took a lot of portraits of families, again, individuals, a lot of portraits of couples. The thing that also that I think people don't know about, again, is his uh, funerary portraits. And he actually created this sort of genre, if you will, of, of funerary portraits, where he would infuse photographs of, of the person from real, you know, when they were alive, um, montage, if you will, with uh, images you know, the pictures that he took at their funeral, and then sometimes even put across it uh, poems, sometimes original, sometimes not. This is actually a funerary portrait of his daughter, um, Rachel, who died, um, passed away at the age of 15. And so these are some black photographers who are making or made an enormous impact on the genre and art form of photography. People like Ernest Withers, who some people don't want to talk about Ernest Withers because Ernest Withers took some of the best, most incredible photographs of the civil rights movement, particularly those of Martin Luther King. But due to the, um, the Public Information um, Act, it was discovered that um, Ernest Withers was actually an FBI informant. And so people, he, his daughter actually is on record as saying that he had three cameras with him at all times. One camera that he basically sent the film to like white press, white media. Another camera that he sent the film to like black press and black media and another camera that he kept for his personal archive. And so if you look at his body of work, it's absolutely stunning. But yeah, he was an FBI informant. Um, Roy de Carava, Lorna Simpson, which, okay. Uh, Lorna Simpson, um, which, anyway. Um, John W. Mosley, Richard Samuel Roberts, Dina Lawson, Dawood Bay, Ronnie Nicole Smith, and Michaela Pilar Brown. So now, what I would like for you all to do, if you haven't, is to walk um, through the gallery, and then I will be here to, add, to answer any questions that you might have about any specific uh, pieces of work. And then I, I do kind of want to call out a couple, but I'll wait until you all come back. Oh, and the last thing I want to say, these are the questions that we had. What is blackness? What does race mean in this era? Does it even matter? How do images hinder or help our understanding of blackness and black people and of ourselves? Do we have the language to capture what is going on in the world socially and politically? 
what movements, ideas, figures, or actions are happening right now that can help us process these times? Is blackness defined by whiteness? What about the diaspora? What do we know about race, racism, blackness through exploring other identities such as gender, age, socioeconomic background? What can we learn from black photographer, photographers about blackness and black people? And what are we missing about the knowledge that we have about what we know and how do we know it? So those are the questions that I want you to think about as you wander the gallery. Yes. Wander and then reconvene, I think it, it might be easier. Five, let's do five minutes of wandering and the rest Q&A.
redo it. Good to meet you. So um, I, I know some of I know some folks are still looking. Um, I wanted to, and I know we're kind of past our time, but I wanted to call out the series of photographs here by the Nap Ministry, and we thought it was really important to um, include these works because, again, when we think about images in the media, we hardly ever see images of black women resting or black women uh, in a certain type of um, luxury or opulence, if you will. And if you don't know Trisha Hershey, she's based in Atlanta. She's an archivist, a spiritual evangelist, if you will. She talks to corporations around the world about the need for rest and how rest is a way for um, everyone to dream, but for particularly for black people to dream as a kind of um, and, and reimagine their experience as a kind of reparations. And she came to this work because in her um, archival studies, she kept basically looking at the, the archival records and it was basically, and also looking at things like black codes and basically intrinsically understanding that not only did black people not have their um, autonomy over their own body, but they did not even have the right to leisure and rest. Like every day of their, every minute of their day had to be accounted for. So much so that that played into tropes around black people and laziness, black people and loitering. You know how they, you know people have you know stereotypes like black people just stand around and they don't like to work and whatever. She traced it back in these archives to this notion that. Black folks didn't have agency to actually carve out time to rest and dream and have imagination that they had to be productive in order to maintain their value, their market value, if you will. Um, right here in this middle section, and Carol, if you want to talk any, if you want to say anything about this, please feel free. We wanted to also highlight um, this work <clears throat> again. That's a sort of homage to um, Trayvon Martin, and. The last thing I'll say is, oh, on this wall, on this other wall, um, all of the, the work that is happening right now around the country in terms of black people and land and farming, and how this is also a kind of reparations movement, if you will, how black people can not only center and uh, joy and sustain themselves um, through creating safe spaces that are land-based, but also that um, there's this whole kind of connection to ancestral knowledge, particularly through folks like um, Soul Fire Farm um, and the two sisters, um, what am I looking at their names? Naima and Leah, thank you, um, who have basically, I don't even know, basically like a radical farm school, if you will. They're teaching people ancestral, African-centered ancestral ways of farming, um, of sustainability, of taking care of yourself through being able to grow your own food, right? So I just want to make sure that I highlight those works. And if anybody has any questions for me, I'm, I'm happy now to answer any questions. And thank you again for coming. Yeah.